few minutes to read the hall on the first floor of the library or all invited to attend. primarily concerned with uh, Saturn's giant moon Titan, and also looking at astrobiology, as well as looking at subterranean life, life right here on this Earth that exists in the deep dark, down underneath our feet. So there's a big question, and that is, are we alone? And this was formulated by a guy named Frank Drake, and he wrote what's called the, the Drake Equation. And this is almost like a cocktail <laughs> exercise, just come up with kind of an estimate of how many alien civilizations might be out there. And so it starts with trying to figure out about how many stars are being formed out there in the universe. How many of those stars might actually have planets around it? And then on those planets, how many of them would have started life? Recognized by these little green guys here. And then of those, how many would form a civilization, maybe like ours, maybe more advanced? And then how many of them would be able to communicate? And then kind of on the end game, how many of them would have ended up going away and we would never hear from them again? So sort of your lifetime of your civilization. And if you come up with all these numbers, you can figure out about how many civilizations are out there. So this was written, I'm trying to remember what it was, I think it was back in the 60s or 70s, it was a long time ago, and we didn't know a lot about the universe as we do now. So we know that there's an awful lot of stars out there, but we have a pretty good rough idea about how many there are at this point in our galaxy. We're finding out very recently that there's a lot of planets out there. And there's a lot of planets out there that might be in a zone that could sustain life, and we'll talk about that, because that whole definition thing is very important. And when we get to this point, which is how many places could form life, that's where we're still doing active research to try to figure out what kinds of conditions and planets are able to create and sustain life. And that's what I'd really like to talk to you about today, is those two middle numbers of what types of planets can exist and which ones can support life. And those are like two, kinda, two questions that are very coupled together. Because the more we learn about other planets and planets in our own solar system and life on Earth, the more we start expanding our range of where life could actually exist. So before we get into that, we've got to start getting into some really, really big questions. And one of the big ones is, what exactly is life? Um, we're all alive. Oh. Um, <laughs> bacteria, they're alive. Viruses, are they alive? Typically, no. Prions? Yeah, so it gets, it, but you gotta, you know, parasites, it gets kinda wiffly waffly in there about trying to figure out exactly where you draw that line. And then looking at our own planet, you gotta ask, you know, how was Earth when life first started? It was very different than it is right now. So what were the conditions like back then? Where did life start? How did it start? And then what environments support life on Earth today? <clears throat> we started out thinking of trees and bunnies and all that sort of stuff, but now we're finding out that Earth is much, much more complicated than that. And there's life in a lot of different places that we had not thought existed where life could exist maybe 50 years ago. 
And then finally, when we see all these different environments, we gotta ask, are there places in our solar system that could mimic those same environments? So maybe life could exist on those places today. So getting back to that big question, what is life? So I'm trained as an organic chemist, and I think life is just chemistry. That's it. <laughs> so the basics of life are you start with some type of an energy source of food, light, and you're able to take those inputs and convert them into some type of chemical energy. Then you take that chemical energy. You basically put money in the bank, and then you take it out of the bank, and you build things. You build new cells, you build structures, you metabolize. Eventually, you're going to build another copy of yourself, and you're going to reproduce. And that's the way that life can be successful. It gets bigger, it expands, it multiplies. So there's an energy source. Here's the basic design, and I really apologize to all the biologists. This is like an oversimplification of everything. <laughs> but it's really how life works on Earth. <coughs> Here's the key parts, is you have a cell, sort of an outer baggie that holds everything inside the cell or outside the cell. You have the DNA, which is your information carrying molecule. You can think of this as the library, where you have all the information about how to build a body or cells or parts. Then you have the assembly, the RNA. This is kind of like the blueprint. You go into the library, you copy off a blueprint, then you go down to the factory floor, and on the factory floor, you use the RNA to then assemble a bunch of amino acids, link them together, create a protein structure, and then that protein structure is one of the parts of the cell that does stuff. Usually like a chemical transformation that acts as a catalyst and helps move things forward. In some cases, you can have a protein which is now stuck inside the membrane. And what that does is if there's a difference between the outside and the inside, you can use that to create energy. And then that's how you power the whole thing in the cell. So these five bits are the really important functions that every cell has to have in order to function and be alive. Okay, so on our planet, most of the life that we've discovered has those key molecules. It has a phospholipid membrane, has DNA, has RNA, has a protein made out of amino acids, and usually the metabolism is a protein plus membrane combined up together. Is that the only game in town? We don't know. Uh, how did life start? Maybe it started with you had the bags first. You had that membrane, and then somehow the function started working inside the cell. Or maybe you started out with um, uh, your information carrying molecule first, that library, that uh, blueprint. And it turns out that RNA and DNA both can hold information. So you could have started off with RNA and then eventually you know, upgrade it to get DNA. Or another possibility is maybe you started with the whole catalytic cycle first. So you had clay. Clay, in some cases, can actually function as a catalytic surface. So maybe that was doing the metabolism way in the before time, before chemical life turned into biology life. And then finally, another idea is that maybe you had metabolism first, and that started with some type of inorganic rocks, like iron sulfides and some of these chemical gardens that people have played with, um, and that has <coughs> created the, 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 the energy mechanism, and then all the other pieces and parts started together. We don't know how life started. We just know that it runs today, and there's actually a lot of research being done examining each of these. My lab mate actually does a lot of stuff on the uh, iron sulfide world. So there's, it's, it's like a very big question, and we don't know the answer, but it's really fun to try and figure it out. So we don't exactly know how it worked, but we can have a rough idea of the pieces and parts that you needed initially to start bringing these things together. And one of the big surprises is that a lot of the basic parts, the very early, early little building blocks, are very common in the universe. One of the things that we're always used to is hearing these science fiction stories where the evil space aliens come down to planet Earth because they want our water. And that's, that's just not <laughs> going to be necessary because the water is incredibly common in the universe. We have moons that are basically nothing but water. At its core, my favorite moon, Titan, is basically a large amount of water. A little bit of rock, but a lot of water. So Earth, if you really look at it, is a sphere, has a very thin shell of water. 
And really, the amount of Earth is dry, and it just has little puddles on it. I mean, Earth is a couple thousand kilometers, and the oceans are maybe 10 kilometers deep, so it's, it's really pretty dry down here. Out there in the solar system, you've got water everywhere. Comets, uh, icy moons, icy worlds, all sorts of stuff. What's also interesting is you have a lot of small organic molecules. So things like methane, things like hydrogen cyanide, things like formaldehyde. These are things that you can then use to build up to larger structures. And some of this can actually happen naturally. Uh, my favorite moon right here is Titan. <coughs> and we think it, it's interesting because it has a very thick, smoggy atmosphere. It has a lot of methane in, the, uh, in its atmosphere. And under sunlight, the methane transforms itself and becomes very large and very complex uh, molecules. So you start from the small organic molecules, you get the bigger ones, possibly you get the prebiotic com compounds, so things that are just ready for the spark of life. And then the step that we call before you have actual biology kicking in, you have organized chemistry, where you have organic reactions that are running, doing that whole building and assembling energy, but it's not quite self-replicating life yet. Maybe this is happening on Titan, we don't know. What we do suspect is that the early Earth, when it started, might have looked a lot like Titan. It might have had a lot of methane in its atmosphere. It might have been very smoggy. There might have been very complex chemical reactions happening on Earth, raining down onto the oceans and onto the surface, and then all that got transformed by life as food stuff. But maybe those same molecules might be existing on Titan by the shovel load, waiting for us to go to Titan, scoop it up and say, wow, this is the kind of stuff that started life on Earth many billions of years ago. So one of the molecules that you get when you do laboratory experiments trying to mimic Titan's chemistry is you just take uh, light, you take nitrogen, you take methane, you put it in a tube, maybe you suck it down to a low vacuum, you zap it, and you get this stuff that comes out called tholins, okay? Sometimes it's orange, sometimes it's black, it depends exactly on the experimental conditions. But when you take these materials and you throw them into water and you boil them up, and usually a little bit of base, like ammonia, you end up getting amino acids out. And amino acids are the things that we use to construct proteins, enzyme chains, and make very large biological structures. So when you look at these things, you might want to think that this is actually a picture of your great, 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 great ancestor long before chemistry ever converted over into becoming biology. So, uh, the conditions on the early Earth were really brutal. It was a very young planet, very active, lots of volcanic activity, plate tectonics was just starting to kick in, but there weren't any big continents assembled yet. This is probably what it looked like, a whole series of volcanic island arcs spewing into a, high, into a very carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. It was hot, it was hellacious, but one of the most amazing things about this is that life started back then. We've got rocks. In fact, we're, the, the more we examine this, the earlier we're pushing back the life. We think that life now might have started very soon after all of these meteorites and asteroids were bombarding the Earth very, very early. Life may have actually started a couple of times and then gotten wiped out as all these meteorites came in and blew the place flat. And then the life that's existing now might have been the lucky one that survived. So this is what life looked like for the bulk of the time here on Earth. I'm going to do something fun. All right. So, ma'am, can you hold your hand up? So we're going to say this is the beginning of life on Earth right here. You started. Okay. So that was the beginning of life on Earth. When we get to about here, sir, why don't you hold your hand up? This is when we started getting uh, multicellular organisms. So we had a huge space of time. And then right about here, this is when the dinosaurs walked on the planet. And sir, you're going to put your hand up, and you're going to scoot it way over there. And that's about when we arrived on the scene. So there's a huge amount of time when life existed on the planet, and it looked like this. Time average, this is what life looks like on Earth. These are bacterial colonies. They drink seawater, they bring in a little bit of photosynthetic activity, they build little structures. Uh, I brought one in for show and tell. This is an old 
fossilized one from about 320 million years ago. Um, Mississippian of age, it's heavy as heck because it's mostly iron. Uh, I'll leave it up here for y'all to come up and check out after the lecture. But basically, this is what life looked like for most of Earth's history. So any alien coming to our planet at any time average would say, this is life on Earth. This is it. <laughs> that's boring, that's good. <laughs> so, this is an example of something that we had seen, these are known, uh, out in the southern part of Death Valley. This is about 1.2 billion years old. It still had 700 million years before multicellular life and the bulk of the fossil record kicked in. So these guys have been around for a very long time, pretty much unchanged in appearance. So now the next question is, is what kind of environments support life on Earth? And this is a chronicle, yeah, sorry, this is a very cool picture. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been to Yellow, Yellowstone and seen Grand, 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 Grand Prismatic? This is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that we didn't know that life could exist in such hostile environments. And it turns out that all of those colors that you see in the spring are from bacteria that can live under really hot, thermally challenging conditions. The other reason this is important is because some biologists were out there trying to study how life worked and they examined some of these bacteria and they were wondering, you know, how do they survive? How are they able to reproduce and replicate DNA at such high temperatures? And they isolated out an enzyme that's called TAC, T-A-Q. And the reason that TAC is so important is because it's an enzyme that is able to synthesize and bind and lock up DNA at very high temperatures. So if you're interested in growing up DNA and analyzing it, you want to elevate it to a high temperature, cool it down so you can cycle it very quick. TAC is the basis of all, almost most of the biotechnology that we use today. So things where you see CSI, where they're doing the DNA fingerprinting, DNA typing, you talk up here about PCR technology, that's all because of stuff that came out of Grand Prismatic Spring. So this is a really cool example of where you're trying to study life, you're trying to do this clearly scientific investigation, and you come up with something that is incredibly practical and is basically a driver for the economy in the United States and most of the world today. So I don't even know where we would be without the invention and discovery of TAC. Fundamental to pharmaceutical research, to forensic medicine, to possibly even your trip to the doctor in the very near future. Well, the way we used to think about life was this picture. This beautiful little sylvan glade, little thing bubbling through, trees, rhododendrons, ferns, moss, totally wrong. This is not life on Earth. This is, this is not a typical picture. This is just the, the weirdness, the weird aberration that's life on land. What life on Earth really looks like is this. This is a picture of the deep ocean floor. Remember, 70% of Earth's surface is covered by water. And most of it is about uh, a mile deep. So there was an expedition uh, off of the coast of Washington State uh, a few years ago, and they were streaming it live on HD. And it was really cool, because you could see these pictures that were coming in live from the submersible, bopping along this volcanic area underneath the ocean. And that was when I realized this is the first time I've ever seen the surface of the Earth, what it really looks like. So this is the typical view. You have some volcanic rock deep underwater, and you have a little denizen of Earth, and that's a little happy crab. It was kind of cute. They called <coughs> up on the uh, camera and started poking around at it. But this is, this is typical Earth's surface. And where they were going was another fascinating place that we didn't know about until very recently, maybe 30 years ago. And these were these hydrothermal vents. And these are places where Earth's um, surface is diving underneath itself, creating a lot of hot energy, hot liquids, liquid water, high metals, a lot of sulfide, comes boiling out of these vents. And you would think that it would be just the most hellacious place on Earth, that nothing could live there. And it was the exact opposite. There were these colonies of things living everywhere. There's no sunlight down here. Right? This is all chemical energy. Lots of very reduced uh, metal species, and all of these creatures are taking those metal species, oxidizing them up, 
and forming this massive intricate chain of life, a whole ecosystem, but it's all based on chemical energy. And this is actually gonna be a really important concept that we're just starting to figure out, is that life doesn't need sunlight, it needs chemical energy, a gradient. If you ever find a chemical gradient, that's usually where you start finding life. Life will usually find a way. So here's an example that's even creepier. It's kind of fun. Uh, they discovered this off of the Mexican coast in another hydrothermal vent field. This is a bacteria that does photosynthesis from the infrared glow of one of those hydrothermal vents. It doesn't need sunlight. It's using natural infrared radiation. It's taking hydrogen sulfide. This is important. We'll follow track on that in a minute. It's taking hydrogen sulfide and converting it to complex sugars and then precipitating out sulfur. So these guys are doing photosynthesis in a place that doesn't have light. You can start thinking now, if there are hydrothermal vents that exist on Europa, <coughs> deep, far away from any sunlight, they could be perfectly happy and they would never know the difference because they have that chemical, geochemical gradient and that energy that they can then use to drive their life processes. Okay, so here's another fun discovery. They were going down in an ROV sub, deep underneath our oceans. You see a recurring theme every time you go down into the deep oceans where we haven't explored, we start discovering new things. So they go down deep, and they're off in the Gulf of Mexico, and they go all the way down to the bottom. And the thing that they find down there is a lake, right? That's not normally what you think of down underneath the ocean, but there's a lake down there. And it's made of fluids, water, that are very, very high salinity, much more uh, salty than the ocean. They're so salty that they form almost a new layer at the bottom of the ocean, these little pockets. And when the submersible went down there, they, they actually poked at it. And you could see these little ripples going across this little pond underneath the ocean. And underneath that ocean, you had a lot of methane seeping itself up and just charging all of those fluids, those kind of lake fluids with methane. Around it, there was colonies, huge colonies of oysters. There were bacteria that were eating the methane, the oysters were eating the bacteria, they were happy, then there we had these random eels coming in and eating the oysters. You had this whole ecosystem that was running off of the methane eating bacteria that were living off the geochemical gradient of this brine sea underneath the ocean. You go further away from these into the just regular normal deep ocean, very barren. So these are an oasis for life. And this isn't the only one they found. They found a couple others. And this is one that's kind of interesting where they found these creatures living down in a similar brine pool underneath the Mediterranean <laughs> Ocean. And what's interesting about this is that these don't use oxygen at all. We used to think that it was necessary to have complex multicellular life. You had to have oxygen because it was sort of like that high octane fuel that you could burn and get that energy. And that everything that didn't have oxygen that didn't use it to oxidize was too low of energy and we were just limited to small bacteria. And then we found this. This is a little thing, it has a head, it has structures, it has a body, but it doesn't use oxygen. Instead it uses, um, well actually it's this guy's burning with acid. So he's taking uh, pyruvic acid, oxidizing it up, and then kicking out CO2, and that's how he makes his living. But it's multicellular. It doesn't have the mitochondria, those energy producing structures in our cells, you might have heard of. It has a funky thing called hydrogenosomes, which is able to do a similar, but very different type of biological process. Now, the other thing, going beyond the ocean, you start thinking about the earth. There's a lot of earth under there, right? Uh, we live on a sphere of rock. There's thin parts of ocean, but most of the planet is solid rock. And it turns out that there's life that lives in solid rock, and it can eat it, and it can survive. So here's an example of a cave expedition I was on. Um, this was in Carlsbad Caverns. It's one of the caves that's actually closed to the public. Um, and you have a lot of research that is being done of examining a lot of these cave formations that everybody used to think was just pure inorganic chemistry. It turns out that a lot of it is the result of biological activity. These things grow very slowly. They do things like they eat some of the iron, they convert it from one type of iron into another, iron 2 to iron 3, or iron 3 to iron 2, iron 2. 
but they live and grow very slowly. And here we're actually culturing them out so we can make more of them so we can study them and see how they live. And we, I was asked to go on an expedition down to a cave in uh, southern Mexico. And there we found these really gross little things that we called phlegm balls because they were disgusting. Um, but these are colonies of bacteria. And the way they live is they take hydrogen sulfide, stinky rotten egg gas, and they take it and they oxidize it up with a little bit of oxygen and they make H2SO, uh, sulfuric acid. And that's how they make their living. And they're perfectly happy doing that. They just need a little bit of extra nutrients, a little bit of carbon material so they can build their little bodies, but they're more than happy to take hydrogen sulfide and create hydrogen or sulfuric acid from it. So we're seeing another theme, and that is that oxygen isn't absolutely necessary. You can do just fine with sulfur. In fact, we think that maybe sulfur might have been how life started, and then it eventually weaned itself off sulfur and then converted over to oxygen because it's a little bit better fuel. And then finally we get to these guys, who are some of my favorite. They found these by drilling in the uh, volcanic table lands of Washington State. They drilled down, I think it was three kilometers, and they dredged these guys up. And these guys are effectively a multi-fuel bacteria. They can eat any type of metal. You give them a the metal, they'll take it, convert it to the other one, and be perfectly happy. So for example, they take iron three to iron two, manganese four to manganese two, vanadium five, to vanadium-4, technetium-7, to technetium, oh wow, what is that? <coughs> that's a lot. Um, and then more important, uranium-6 to uranium-4. So in the US, in the Southwest, we have a lot of uranium deposits. We think now that the way that we got those uranium deposits is through these guys. You had uranium ions circulating through in the fluids. These guys ate it pooped it out as a more insoluble material, so it just sat there in the earth, and then later on, those became the uranium deposits that we are currently mining for our nuclear energy. So we owe our nuclear energy to these little bacteria. Pretty cool, so they're important. But it also shows that these guys can convert metals and a lot of different metals. So if you had any gradients on another planet, if you had a bunch of iron three, and if you had any of those, these guys would be able to chew down on it and survive. All right, so now we talk about some of the harsher environments. So what about things that are radiation? You think that you know radiation is really tough, really bad, kills everything. Turns out that these guys survive in it. Uh, where they were first isolated was in cans of spam that had been irradiated for the US Army. And they found out that there was some bacteria that managed to live in it. These guys now currently contaminate most of the melt, the uh, radioactive water pools in most of the nuclear reactors uh, worldwide. And they can survive uh, the radiation. They have a very good uh, repair mechanism for handling that damage. So if you had a planet that had a very high radiation environment, these guys would do just fine. They'd survive. All right. Now, getting really <coughs> deep, uh, these guys were found they were found down deep. They were found in one of those gold mines in South Africa. And they dredged these up. And these survived by living off of some of the radiation byproducts. Way down deep, almost everything is radioactive, very low level. Uh, these guys survive on the back, the, 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 the pie products from that. They're very isolated. It, doing some of the genetic work using DNA, they figured out that these have been separate from surface life for about three, 15 million years. So these guys have been in absolute total isolation. And you can sit there and you say, well, if Earth was ever wiped out, you know, if you ever destroyed the surface of the Earth, we left from the sun, the sun went away one day, but the Earth cooled, it still has enough geochemical heat to keep water moving around. These guys would never know the difference. They would be there happily living until the Earth's core finally cooled in several billion years. So if you had an environment that had some sort of radioactive activity, just enough to keep it warm, maybe keep water circulating around, maybe say the deep subsurface of Mars, these guys would be perfectly happy. They wouldn't know the difference. And now the last one is that we're just starting to think about life in the clouds. Can it exist? Can it reproduce? Could it evolve? 
And there's a lot of planetary atmospheres out there that have a lot of dynamic clouds and a lot of dynamic cloud chemistry. If you can find life that can survive and live in that environment, you've just suddenly expanded all of your environments multifold across the universe. All right, so now we're going to talk about the habitable environments. We've seen a good tour of how wild and different types of environments that life can live in. How about some of those environments on other places and around our solar system? So can anybody guess, or even know, where the most habitable place outside of Earth is in our solar system? Want to take a hazard? Mars? <laughs> Wrong. There's a place that's actually better. Nope, not even tight. Jupiter. Nope. Okay, you ready? You want to guess? Mercury. <laughs> no, but you were close. Venus. Venus. But where on Venus? In the, in the core. No, not in the core. In the clouds. Yes. So if you look at the pressure of Venus, it's very high pressure at the surface. If you go up, the pressure decreases. It's really hot down on the surface as well. And if you go up, the temperature drops. Mm -hmm. And at some point, about 30 kilometers, oops, sorry, 50 kilometers above the surface, you have an environment that is just as comfortable in terms of pressure and temperature as it is right here. About 20 degrees Celsius and say one atmosphere. Now the only bummer is that you have to deal with a bunch of sulfuric acid. <laughs> For us, that's a problem. For some of those bacteria, they're totally cool with it. Mm -hmm. They live in it. That's what they do. If you had a chemical gradient, they would be fine. And that's why when we're starting to think about life in the clouds, this gets really important. If life started on Venus, could it have ever migrated to the clouds before the conditions on the surface became so terrible? Inhospitable. Another possibility, this is one of everybody's favorites, is Europa. So it's, Europa is a moon of Jupiter. It orbits in a resonance, so it's always getting a little bit perturbed. So its core is always being a little bit flexed and squeezed around. So it has an icy shell, but deep underneath it has that flexing going on. So you have a very good potential for having hydrothermal vents happening at the bottom of the surface. So here's a picture that kind of shows that. You have an icy shell, and then you have this subsurface activity, and you have these hydrothermal vents shooting up into that ocean. So going back to that cave, oops, sorry. so we're actually doing work and looking at simulating some of those conditions and trying to figure out the kind of chemistry and type of chemical synthesis, of organic synthesis, that can occur. This is uh, Lauren White, who's sitting there setting up a uh, experiment that's going to be simulating the really high pressure and the temperatures that exist uh, down at underneath the ocean of Europa. And this is one of the reasons we went to that cave in Mexico, is here's a place where you can see some caver legs sitting there. There's a stream underneath in this cave. One part of the stream has the sulfur vents coming up, so very hydrogen sulfide rich waters, right here. And then over here, a little bit rustier color, you have a lot of oxygen rich waters. Now, you look at Europa, you turn it on its side, you have hydrogen sulfide rich waters here. If you have UV photolysis hitting the ice, converting into reactive oxygen species, some type of subduction, if you have the crust cycling into the ocean, you can have very rich oxygen-rich waters up here could mimic exactly the type of conditions you see right here, and that's where we find some of those bacteria. So again, you take those bacteria, you throw them on Europa, they might be perfectly happy. They would never know the difference. Another favorite is Saturn's moon Enceladus. So the problem with Europa is it has a gravity field. It's deep in Jupiter's gravity well, so to get there is going to be really tricky. You're going to have to land, find the best spot, drill through the ice, try to explore that ocean, it's going to be really tough. Enceladus also has water. Maybe it has the same type of uh, activity and chemistry that's occurring on Enceladus, but the beauty about Enceladus is it's spraying these jets of water out into space. So if you have little cells of bacteria that are being shot out by these, by these jets, your spacecraft might be able to swing right by, scoop them up, and analyze them and detect them right there. So on Enceladus, the life comes to you. It's a good thing. So that makes a mission to Enceladus a very compelling target as well. And then we have everybody's favorite, which is Mars. So here's a picture of the Pathfinder landing site. This was up in the high northern plains of Mars. 
And the reason this is so important is we were looking for ice on Mars. And we didn't know if it was there. We thought that maybe we'd find some on the subsurface. Maybe we could get some evidence for it. The beauty is when this thing came down, its retro, retro jets basically blasted away a very thin layer of Martian soil and uncovered a big block of ice. Very cool. We did some soil analysis, and so we were able to figure out the conditions on the surface of, uh, of Mars. It's not super hospitable. And so what they did is they wanted some, uh, chem or some scientists at the DLR, which is kind of like the German equivalent of NASA, they created a death chamber for, for Earth life. They created a little simulator to simulate the conditions that we learned from, from the Phoenix mission. So high CO2 atmosphere, uh, harsh UV radiation. There's a series of LED lights right here that are going to mimic that high UV radiation. Oxidizing materials at the surface, there's perchlorates. That was kind of a surprise. Uh, very low pressure. They cheated a little bit. They allowed it to get a little bit wet in the morning. I mean, we're talking really, really hyper arid, like beyond Sahara, but still a little taste of water in the morning. And they had these very large temperature swings like you have on Mars. It has a very thin atmosphere, so the temperature goes all over the place. So what they did is they created this little cage of death, death chamber, and they started putting things in it. They wanted to see if anything could survive. And it turned out they had a winner, these guys. This is a high polar, high altitude, high, uh, high latitude, high altitude lichen existed in the North Polar area. I think it was near the Svalbard Peninsula. They lived on Mars. Not only did it just live in those conditions, but it metabolized. It was happy. It was doing its life thing. It wasn't just protecting itself in a spore, it was surviving, thriving, and living. They let it go for about 28 days. So it was a long duration experiment. Um, but these guys lived. They also found some cyanobacteria that were able to survive as well. So if you put these lichen on the Martian surface today, it would live and be happy. So life could very easily exist on Mars. It also means it's very important when you send spacecraft to Mars, you need to scrub it because you want to make sure that we're not contaminating that place because it would be absolutely horrible to go to Mars and discover the same things that we had here on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so, getting it down, we, we, we see that every time we look for life somewhere on our planet, we see it, we find it, it's always there. Life will always find a way. If you have a geochemical gradient, if you have some way that life can make a living, it's gonna find it, it's gonna exploit it. So when we start looking at the different worlds around the solar system, we're starting to find more and more environments that mimic the places that we find life here on Earth. So it seems very likely that out there, somewhere, there might be life. And it's gonna be very hard to try to find it. But that's what we do, is we try to do that. And the important thing to remember is that right now, we only have one example of life in the universe, and that's right here on Earth. So it's very important that we understand how life functions, how it works, what kinds of environments it can survive in, how it started, and then take some of those ideas, start thinking about other planets, but then also realize that there's always a possibility that there could be another way of doing things that we just haven't considered yet. Okay, and with that, I want to thank you all very much, and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. I have a question on uh, late right. in Antarctica. Um, what's the latest in search of? I don't know. And for everybody else in the audience, so the, there's a lake down in Antarctica that was very uh, interesting, especially for astrobiological uses, and Europa. It's a lake that is, uh, well, it's fresh salt water that exists underneath the ice cap of Antarctica. And it has been sealed off for a very, very long period of time. And what they want to do is they want to drill through the ice and see what kinds of things are living down there. Have they been sealed away? How have they? It, it could be almost like a time capsule. But one of the really cool things to do, or one of the reasons that they're doing that, is that they can use that as a simulation for what it would be like to go to Europa, which might also have icy lakes, maybe not so deep underneath the surface of Europa, or maybe use the same technologies and drill all the way down through the ice and get to that subsurface ocean on Europa. Yes? Have they uh, looked at other uh, solar systems 
Yeah, so we're finding a lot of other solar systems. Um, right now what we're doing is we're trying to characterize the planets that are in those other solar systems. So what we'd really like to do is do what we call get the magic pixel, where we can see the spectral uh, data and try to figure out what <coughs> kinds of chemical compounds are in those atmospheres. But again, that's only going to tell you the chemistry that might exist. It won't be able to tell you for sure if there's life or not. We're going to have to do a lot of work to be able to figure that out. Can we get, so there's no way we can get even any sort of close. No. Oh man, no. I, I mean, the, the, going to another solar system is a technological leap that's just incredible. So right now, I mean, you saw about how long it's taking to get to Pluto mm -hmm. with our current technology. New Horizons is going to get there next year. Uh, help me out, I think it launched in 2003, 2004. So that's like 10 years to get to Pluto. Your next star system is a couple hundred times, thousand times farther. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, I assume they're fairly convinced that there's got to be some other intelligent life out there. <coughs> that seems likely, <laughs> but we don't know. What, what well, seems likely? It seems likely that there would be intelligent life out there. Just if you assume that the life on Earth started small and got itself big. But again, we only have an N of one. So we don't know. And we don't know. And yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Uh, for this uh, question. Right. What's yes, your sir. opinion on the UFO explosion project that occurred in 2001? I don't have any opinion on it. I don't know anything about that at all. Okay. Well, in 2001, over 100 members of our government, including scientists, engineers, and other military members, came forward in a press conference saying that everything that they were saying was true and that they would testify to Congress that we've been in touch with extraterrestrials since the 1940s. Okay. It's I, on YouTube. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know, honestly. <laughs> yes, sir. What's a typical day at the office like for you? Wow. Uh, it's a scramble. Um, most of my work is done simulating Titan lakes. So that's dealing with liquid methane and liquid ethane and trying to see how organic materials would dissolve and move around. So one of the things that's a little bit further beyond what I'm talking about here is most of the life that we're used to dealing with is using water as a solvent. We're thinking or wondering if maybe there are other solvents, other liquids that could be used. So if you start thinking about things like methane or ethane, which are actually fairly common in the universe too, could you have chemistries and biochemistries that exist and create life living structures that could exist on those places? So maybe places like Titan or other slightly warmer places. I'm a personal fan of propane. I love propane. It's very easy to make chemically, should be very common in the universe, has an incredible liquid range, right? I, I mean, water has one too. If you go to really high pressures and really high temperatures, water will, can still exist as a liquid. Propane does the same thing. And it does things at a very low temperature or a very low pressure too. If you took some of Pluto's moons, or Pluto, and you shoved it a little bit further into the solar system, um, you could have propane lakes and liquids existing on its surface. So all of a sudden, we're starting to, to think, we're wondering, really. We're wondering if life could exist with other non-water solvents, kind of really stretch it out. And in that case, the planets that could exist out there in the solar, in the world, in the universe, become incredibly huge. So, yeah, sorry. I read somewhere that on Venus, uh, at, at the closest point to the sun, it's something like 50 or 60 million miles, and then 150, because of the path around the sun. So would that have an effect on the, because you're talking about light in the clouds, would it have an effect on that? Venus, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure about that orbital eccentricity. I right. think it's a little bit more circular than that, but it is, Venus is a very, very brutal place. Right. But it's predominantly because it has a very thick atmosphere of CO2. The thinking that I'm aware of is that it used to be like Earth, had plate tectonics, but at some point it lost its magnetic field. And so the water kept boiling up, the plate tectonics maybe, as the water went away, the plate tectonics shut down, 
and all of a sudden it wasn't able to scrub the CO2 out of its atmosphere very well. So it went into this super greenhouse effect and it just became the place that it is today. It's actually a very buffered place because that atmosphere is so thick and it just mixes so well that the temperature on Venus, even at the poles, is almost the same everywhere. Hot, really hot. So life, if it existed on Venus, would have a really, really brutal time of it just because of the temperature. And it's well beyond even the point where CO2 could exist as a supercritical fluid. So life seems like it needs a solvent, some sort of liquid to run around it. And, and also to maybe some consistency, because like the earth were very consistent all of it. And also, um, you know, before we had trees and so forth, we didn't, there was no oxygen here. From what I read that it wasn't oxygen that we know today, because we, we wouldn't have been able to breathe. We couldn't. But remember, those guys, so they, right. they could. And the guys who are living down deep, they're completely insulated, literally, from the climate cycles that happen up here on Earth. Those down in like three kilometer range, they feel the geochemical gradient of the Earth. And if the Earth was, you know, just a frozen ice ball on the surface, or even didn't even have an atmosphere, it didn't have an atmosphere, other things would problem, but they would not know it. So the rays from the sun then could, I guess, penetrate the water and go down as far as it, it can. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't have to rely on the sunlight. No, we, I mean, there was a whole slew of, of bacteria in there that they just feed off a of geochemical gradient. They don't need sunlight at all. They don't even need somebody making products from sunlight that they can then feed off of. It's, they're totally isolated. And they're happy. Uh, that, well, those guys in the gold mine, three to 15 million years without daylight. It's pretty cool. Oh, uh, yes. back. Oh. oh, sorry. Oh. As we continue to get better at looking for fossils, would it be possible to find fossil proof that life started and stopped and then started again? And if so, would it have been different? That's a good question. Uh, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it depends on what sort of minerals got trapped out in some of like the zircons and stuff like that. What kind of conditions they could get. Yeah. And, and sorry, sir, I, 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 I blew you off a couple cycles. Yes. Uh, well, getting back to this thing with the UFO, uh, there's been a lot of companies, you know, like anything else out here. But there's been too many sightings that have not, I mean, by uh, either, uh, the, even the Army themselves, or pilots, or whatever. There's just been too much uh, to say that it's all a bunch of uh, nonsense. Uh, and I'm wondering if it's scientists or if some other air, area within uh, JPL, they're looking at this. Not in my research. That, that's <laughs> that one I can safely say. What is your, as a scientist, what is your uh, opinion as well? My opinion would be, well, if, if we did find alien life, I wouldn't have such a hard time struggling for grant money right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I can very safely say that as far as I'm aware, I do not know of any alien life that has been discovered. It would be big news if we did. But I mean the possibility of The possibility? Pretty obvious. From everything that we're seeing, we think that it's very possible that life could exist on other places. And we're doing, well, I don't want to say that we're doing a good job of narrowing it down. Because every time we think about it, we end up expanding where we think life could exist. So we used to think that you know Mars was a good place, Europa seemed like a pretty good place. We didn't know about Enceladus. And we thought the Titan was too cold, but now <laughs> suddenly Titan looks really good for a couple of reasons. Maybe there's life in those methane lakes. We know that Titan makes a lot of organic chemicals. There is a subsurface ocean way down deep in Titan. If you have hydrothermal vents happening on Titan, you have organics coming down, suddenly you've got water, you've got organics, you've got hydrothermal activity. Titan looks really good. So it kind of goes back and forth. We're getting ready to orbit the uh, Ceres asteroid with the Dawn spacecraft. We think that that might have a water ice shell on the outer part of it. How active is that? What kind of chemicals could be occurring down there? There's a possibility that maybe we'll start expanding and say, hey, you know what? It's possible that life could exist on that place too. So we're going to go into the lab and start doing some experiments to, to examine if that's possible. What sort of conditions could there be? Pluto. That's going to be coming up in another year, too. 
maybe that has a subsurface ocean. Maybe the interaction between Pluto and its moon Charon is causing some tidal flexing and keeps kind of liquids cycling around through there. I got here just a king of Italy. Uh, Titan, that's within our, so I've never uh, yeah. heard of that. It, it's next to what? It's the giant moon of Saturn. Oh, it's the moon. Yes, and we've actually landed on it. Uh, very enough to get some sampling and to know roughly what it looks like on the surface. Yeah. Sir? Uh, you joked a little while about grants, uh, the trouble with getting grants. What, what other, if anything, what other types of uh, resources are available to do the kind of research that you do? Is it just through grants or is it, is it funded other ways? So I do, a lot of my grants come through NASA. Uh, I should, that's actually a good segue. So I could mention something where you guys can get involved. Uh, there is a lake in British Columbia that's called Pavilion Lake. And they've set up a project for citizen scientists, people who are just interested in, in helping out. And what they have is they have a submersible that's gone down underneath this lake. It's a very special environment. Um, has a lot of biological activity, a lot of things that look like stromatolites. And what they need help with is people to look at these images and then classify them as to being either something that looks like a stromatolite or something that might not be a stromatolite. And there's a huge database of images, and I think it's called the Pavilion Lake Project. And you can search for it, and you can participate and help out for free. I mean, it's, a, it's a login, and you sit there, and you classify images. I think I did a couple of them. It was, it was kind of fun. But again, you're actually sitting there actually doing real science and actually looking at some of the data and some of the structures that these scientists are trying to interpret to discover, you know, if we saw a structure like this on another planet, would that be an indicator for what life looks like? So that was something else that we're sort of starting to figure out is that life likes to make patterns. You see these weird patterns in rocks sometimes, not fossils, but uh, they're called biovermiculation patterns where life makes little zones where it lives and then it's secreted waste products, depleted all the nutrients, and then you have another zone kind of, it looks like hieroglyphs or graffiti in some cases. But maybe if we see patterns like that on the planet, we can say that's life or maybe that's not. Yes, ma'am. There's talk about extracting water from rocks on Mars. Is that really possible? Yeah. So here's a, okay, here's, here's a cool one, okay? Okay. Talk about the moon. What's the most common element on the moon? Craters. What? <laughs> no, element, element, chemical element. Titanium. No. <laughs> what is it? Sorry. Sorry. No. Nope. You guys ready? Oxygen. Really? Wow. Yes. All the rocks are made out of silicates, which have oxygen around it, or aluminates, which also have oxygen. So the most common element on the moon is oxygen. And I met a guy who, his job was to try to figure out how to take lunar rock, heat the heck out of it, and extract that oxygen out of it using solar energy. And the idea would be for a lunar colony, that's how they would get oxygen to breathe, is they would extract it right out of the lunar rock. So the same type of technology could be used on Mars. And that might be, he, he, was, he was cute, he said, hey man, next time we go to the moon, we are not just grabbing rocks and leaving, we are there. So it's kind of cool to see that long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. Sir, I guess that makes question. Over, I guess, our lifetime, maybe the next 50, 75 years, whatever, what interesting events do you see on the horizon for, I guess, the world in this sort of space? Wow. Next year is gonna be awesome. So next year, we're going to be flying to Ceres and getting our first looks at a, a water icy rich asteroid. Uh, we're going to be buzzing New Horizons. Uh, New Horizons is going to be buzzing Pluto Charon. So we're going to get a good look at a potential uh, very distant object, maybe a little bit modified by interaction from being so close. But that might be an indicator of the other types of bodies that exist even further out in the solar system. Um, obviously, the missions that we have going on right now, the Curiosity rover, uh, the Titan Cassini mission is still going on. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's being done in terms of discovery and exploration of the solar system. There's a huge amount of data coming back. A lot of the work that I showed here where we're talking about trying to discover life on our own planet, I mean, the more we look, the more we learn, the more we look even beyond that to, to, to find the true limits of life. We haven't found them yet. And that's what's really fantastic. So they're going to be doing even more extreme exploring. How deep is too deep for life to survive? 
I mean, at some point you think that the, pores, the pressure will be so much that the pore spaces for water crush out and you can't get water circulating around. We haven't found that yet. Some people say it's 10 kilometers, some people say it's even deeper. You've got the entire ocean to explore. We never knew about those. Um, I got a good example. Um, so somebody I did field work with last summer, um, they knew about the hydrothermal vents, but they were looking for hydrothermal vents out in the mid-Atlantic. At some point they said, you know what, our expedition's almost over. We haven't found anything. Let's just chuck the rover over and we'll go prowl around on the surface and see what's down there. <clears throat> and bam, they found this hydrothermal vent complex that's called the Lost City. And the reason it was so impressive is it wasn't a hot hydrothermal vent, it was cooler, much cooler. And it was thought that it was driven by not really this tectonic activity that's really hot and active, but more of a gentle chemical reaction of some of the rocks reacting in a process called serpentinization. Very boring chemistry stuff, happens all the time, but it was shooting out just enough energy to keep water a little bit hot shooting out these nutrients, and again, they found a whole bunch of life that was living off that geochemical gradient. They had no idea it was down there. And they don't even, they, I mean, really knowing how to look for those things is also difficult. It was just pure luck. But that was a big surprise. There might be other surprises down in the ocean or in these deep caves that we have never even thought of, and that will totally blow our minds when we see it. Lake Vostok is a good example, too. Um, that one, probably don't recall the temperature was estimated to be minus 36, considered to be fairly warm. Could be. If the pressure, temperature, water can survive under different conditions as a liquid. So, yeah? Sir? What's the atmosphere pressure on uh, Titan? 1.5 atmosphere. So it's actually it's thicker than it is here. If you were walking around Titan, uh, it would feel like swimming through a down pillow, which is what I heard. Very low gravity. Mm -hmm. So if you built yourself a pair of wings in the garage, <laughs> you could fly on Titan with your own power. How cool would that be? You might freeze up. Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I recently read that there are some places that are discovering that there are large bodies of water under the Earth's crust. I've read it like in the last two weeks. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's fantastic. So is can that water support life? And that's where we get down to that question of how deep can you go and drill and find life? So there's another kind of spooky, creepy thing that I'm not super comfortable with, so I might be wrong on this. But when we look on the surface of the Earth, we see different forests, different trees, like the trees out here in California are very different from the ones on the East Coast, for the most part. When we look at some of these bacteria that we're sequencing out of the hydrothermal vents, if they're in the same environment on Earth, they're the same. They don't have genetic drift. So somehow there's some type of communication so that the bacteria over here are able to mix and breed and end up over there. And it's a whole network of pore spaces and fluids that might be existing under our very feet that we're not aware of. So it's some really fascinating research and work that still needs to be done, but it's just some mind-blowing stuff. Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That uh, the multicellular, uh, multicellular uh, uh, anaerobic uh, thing, right. what is it related to? Is it something that, that migrated into the area and had to adapt, or is it something that, uh, you know, is it archaea? I mean, what is it? No. It, um, I don't remember. I do remember that the name is Laura Sefera. That was the genus of it. So I think you can Google that. I, I do remember Googling it at one time and seeing its little, its tree. It's not totally bizarre. Okay. But on that lines, if you've ever seen like those old textbooks of biology where they show mammals, plants, and stuff, yeah. they've redone one of those yeah. with archaea. And everything that we're used to is this tiny little boring corner over here. And you have all these funky archaea that have branched off and diversified throughout most of Earth's history. And that's also very humbling for us, because it means that all the stuff that we're used to is just tiny. And it's really those guys that count. Uh, yes, sir? If you found like a planet that's in the atmosphere, just has how the atmosphere is composed, like how the Earth was, would it be possible to send like anaerobic bacteria and basically recreate how life on Earth started? 
So that's one of the ideas, is it's called panspermia, that maybe life started somewhere else and that spread throughout the solar system. So one of the possibilities is of all the planets that probably were the most Earth-like and had water and oceans early on, Mars probably had water first because it was smaller, so it cooled quicker, it was also a little bit further from the sun. So there is the possibility that life started on Mars and some of the meteorites carried life from Mars and seeded the Earth and maybe even Venus. So there's a pretty good transfer of stuff from one planet to the other. So that's really possible. And it's possible that when we go to Mars, we may find out that the life there is very similar to us. And we'll have to figure out, was it cross-contamination or was it an independent genesis? One of the reasons why Europa is so interesting is because uh, it doesn't have an atmosphere. So any meteorite coming in is going to impact at orbital speed and basically <laughs> vaporize up. So if there is life that exists on Europa, it's very likely that it had a completely independent start from life here on Earth. Does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, yes, sir, way um, back. As far as uh, your profession is concerned, can you talk a little bit about sort of your background and what is sort of the path, what you take um, and what you do there? So it's weird. <laughs> so I started out as an organic chemist and I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 years. And I got interested in, by going on an amateur website, I got excited about space and planetary science. And then a few years ago, I did a mid-life career change and switched from the pharmaceutical industry into coming out to JPL. And I have absolutely loved every minute of it. So my big, my big thing to say is that it's never too late in life to truly pursue your passion. <laughs> sure. This is not the last question. At one point, I. Uh, it was described, I read somewhere, that, that our sun, our solar system, uh, was, came about late enough that the results of an earlier star exploding and, and dying brought heavier elements in, in here to start with. Is that a factor in your uh, in, in birth of life in our solar system? That might be. So it might be that when we start, when we look at the chemistry of life, uh, we think that a lot of the quote, quote, heavier elements, things like carbon and nitrogen on oxygen and sulfur, they play a pretty important role in a lot of our processes. Hydrogen, yeah, to some extent, helium, not at all. Most of the universe is built out of hydrogen and helium. And so those other trace elements, the ones that are really important, are only present after a large star has generated them inside its core through nuclear processes and then blown its guts out and spewed all those possible nutrients around into other stellar neighborhoods. So we don't know if maybe it's necessary to have a second generation or later star in order to create a habitable environment or, or the chemicals that you need to make a habitable uh, environment and biochemical system. So. Thank you all very much.
There's a really good Nova show on it. And there are these, uh, these guys in Nova. There's actually a lot of biotech bio companies that are coming up on it. Looking at it as well. some type of uh, uh, an environmental effect that somehow altered the DNA and then that somehow propagated forward a few generations. So that's not what you would predict from regular DNA. Wow. Regular, and, it, and it looks like the mechanism for that is you have your genes that have been DNA based there, but that sometimes your body can a methyl group and effectively change and turn off some of those base pairs. And that methylation sequence may have been the thing that got propagated. But the on off group had been set back in the morning. It's pretty cool stuff. It's really fascinating reading, but it just shows it. Um, I it's like it's a whole it's a huge deal. It's like that. Uh, epigenetics, E P I G N I T. Only Google it. It's just, it's just mind blowing. Oh, I thought you said Tampa. Oh, Epi, 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 Yep. E P I. Epi. Yep. I sure. I was there. Oh wow! Congratulations. And did you like it? Thirty four years. Yeah. More than half. Thank you. I'll give you an interesting my cousin. My cousin. And he's a man. And one of the satellites. Excuse me, sir. Did you know a man named Dalton Webb? And he comes up with some mathematical thing and gets it back. And that was what was asked That he came up, yeah, he was, I think it was even in the paper. He came up with some mathematical thing. You're on your spacecraft deal, so brought it back, so that pretty well solidified his job. Oh, oh, okay. So there was a couple of other guys stationed in the oh, yeah. like, yeah. I don't know if the dinosaurs would have survived or not. That's, 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 that's a really good question. Yeah. Oh, we do for one? Uh, they're happening on a fairly regular basis. So yeah, there's been several on that side. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it's big extinctions happen all the time. That wasn't the big one, was the dinosaur. There was a bigger one back in the... Uh, there was a couple back in too. But there was one back in the... Um, at the Triassic Permian boundary that wiped out, I think it was like 99.5% of all life. Like, right. Aminoids. They, you know, a lot of brachiopod species went away, trilobites. The big, I mean, it was it was bad. But the bacteria was the what? Yeah. yeah. What, what you really blew me away was that Mars thing. That's going to sit on my brain for a while. That Mars could have started life. Right. And uh, uh, meteorites could have settled on Earth. Because that would blow the whole uh, the whole thing about even religion because they claim that all of a sudden, you know, what's the name Mark on Earth? Well, if it came from Mars, I mean, uh, uh, but one thing we can do is the Martians. One question recently, uh, NASA came out with a new uh, study about uh, atmosphere and time. It's probably older than current. Yeah, I haven't read that yet. Uh, Just looking at it today. 
Yeah, I haven't read it yet, I've, but I've, I've, I've seen it, and I don't fully understand what the ramifications of it are. Because uh, when you mentioned that life in clouds, you know, that would totally uh, fall under that category. Yeah. How would that affect it? I'm not sure. I think the idea from the stuff on Titan being all over, I, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I think what it implied was that the materials that delivered those pieces and parts to Titan may not have come from the solar nebula, but they may have come from 